Hello, this is Gail Austin, Director of Community Initiatives at the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. Today I will be presenting on Coaching for Empowerment, and I am so glad that you have joined me this afternoon. When I was thinking about Coaching for Empowerment, I was thinking, Coaching for Empowerment, and it really brought to mind my nephew in his Captain America outfit. So I had to use this graphic on here just to demonstrate how we really are seeking to empower our clients and give them the strength to face the challenges that they're dealing with every day by giving them some of the, stu some of the tools that they need to deal with their everyday challenges. When you think about coaching, you, um, for, for many, many years and most of my life, coaching was basically a sports concept. Uh, I'm sure that most of us have, have had coaches through our lives. I know that even I, who I'm probably the least coordinated person uh, that you would ever know, I, I played basketball just because I was tall and had long arms. So even I've had the experience of working with a coach in my, in my, in my youth. And there are certain things that, that made a good coach good and certain things that, that coaches were supposed to do for us. And I want to bring those to mind before we start thinking about how coaching techniques can be used in the field in which we now work. First of all, coaches teach us the ropes, don't they? They teach us things like the rule of the games. They teach us basic skills. They show us how to do the very basic things that we need to do. They also teach us something about good sportsmanship and how, how to handle ourselves out there on the field or, or on the court. Coaches also look, look to us and help us discover the strengths that we have. What, what are those things that we are able to do very well? They help us highlight those. They see the potential in us. They make us feel like we can do the things that they, they need us to do in those games. Coaches also convince us to keep trying. We've all had those experiences where you just feel like, you know, I just don't have what it takes, or, or I don't know, I don't have the skills, or, or this is just too hard. And they come along and they encourage us, and they, they inspire us. They push us beyond limits so that we will keep trying. Coaches also make us practice. I can remember a time when I thought if I had to run down that basketball court one more time that I would absolutely explode. But something that we learn at a very young age is that practice is necessary in order to improve our, our game, our skills, and so that we can make the, the advance that we want to make. So coaches teach us how important it is to practice to hone our skills. And finally, coaches really do help us be the best we can be. They pull it all together for us. They recognize our strengths. They push us to practice. They inspire us to never give up. And I'm sure if you're like me, you have some very good memories of times when, when your coach was there and helped you be the very best player that you could possibly be. But you know, despite all those wonderful things that coaches bring to us as they're working with us, there's one thing that they can't do. They really can't play the game for us. They can give us the knowledge we need. They can help us develop the skills that they see in us and develop our potential. But it's up to us to play the best game we can play. Because they cannot go out on the court and, and make those, those goals for us. Today, coaching has come to social services. You may have had some, you may have already gone through some training for coaching. You may, you may have heard this, this term used. I know you've probably heard it about life coaches. We hear a lot about people who are coaching people and making life decisions. Well, coaching is also something that is now being done with people who are working in the social service field, helping clients as they deal with a variety of problems they might be dealing with in their lives. It's just a different way of working with the clients that we serve. Coaching versus case management, sometimes people think, well, you know, you, you do either or. And they say, well, what's wrong with case management anyway? And I'm here to tell you there's absolutely nothing wrong with case management. Case management is an invaluable tool that is used to help, help clients as they 
solve their problems in their lives. It links them to, to resources. It does all sorts of the same things that coaching does. So we're not here to dis case management at all. In fact, we can talk about the ways in which case management and coaching are very similar. There's usually an assessment conducted for both case management and coaching where you really dig down deep and find those issues that are most problem problematic for the client that you're serving. Both case management and coaching are all about solving those problems and helping them get to the solutions that they need. It also helps match, those, match the needs to the resources that are available. A good case manager and a good coach both have a very good working knowledge of the resources that are in their community that are available to the client with whom they're working. Both case management and coaching have the ultimate goal of making life easier for the client. But there are also some important differences between case management and coaching. For instance, when you're when you're conducting case management, when you're providing case management for a client, who's the problem solver in, in that scenario? It's generally the case manager, isn't it? And where do you find the solutions? The case manager usually digs into their experience, or they might go back to the office and talk to their team to find solutions to the situations that the client are, are dealing, is dealing with. So who gets to be the hero? Of course, the case manager does. They step in. They come up with the solutions. They find uh, what needs to be done for the situation. And they, they get to be the hero. And that's, that's lovely. It feels good to be a hero. But then what happens the next time a problem comes up for that particular client? If they haven't developed the skills to be their own problem solver, to find their own solutions, to be their own hero, then they're going to be stuck. And they're going to be exactly where they were in the first place. And they're going to need that case manager to help them out. And a very real situation that we all face these days is a situation that there are not enough case managers to go around. There are not enough hours in the day to be there for every client you have every time they come up against a problem. So that's what coaching is really all about. Coaching is an interactive process of exploring client issues leading to effective action in which the coach acts as both a catalyst and facilitator of individual development and transformation. And as you know, catalyst, that's, that's, a, that's an agent of change. You're there to help them change the way they deal with the situations that are at hand. A facilitator, just someone who makes it easier for them to identify the next steps that they should take. And we're really talking about developing and transforming that client into someone who's fully equipped to handle those issues or handle new issues as they come up, and they have the power to deal with them on their own. So coaches, first of all, they help people think for themselves. Secondly, they help people find the best in themselves. And these two things will lead to their personal success in dealing with whatever challenges they come up against in their lives. There are certain traits that are inherent to good coaches, first of which is, which is empathetic. It's really helpful for a coach to be able to put themselves in the shoes of that client. You know, we all have very different lives going on. We all have different uh, strengths that we bring to the table. We have different concerns. Uh, what, what, in a certain you might come into a certain situation with a client, and you know how that would make you feel. You know how you would want to respond. But it's really important to be empathetic with how they're responding, how they're feeling about that situation, to take the time to really put their shoes on and walk a mile. Coaches are patient. It's a lot easier to step in and say, look, this is what you need to do, X, Y, Z. Now go do it. It takes a lot of patience 
to draw them out, to think through the steps of the problem solving, to come up with their own ideas about solutions. It's, it's, it's more time consuming and it takes a lot of patience to help them. What, what I like to say it's like they have their little, little baby steps and they have their little baby wings. So they're flapping those little bitty wings as they're developing these skills. And it takes a lot of patience to let them build a strength in their own little wings rather than just swooping down and picking them up and carrying them away. Good coaches have to think quick on their feet. You have to respond by developing in your mind how you're going to lead this particular client to the right questions and the right answers. Because you're not, you're not pushing them, you're not dumping it on them, you're helping them think through the process. And that takes a, that takes a very special skill set. It takes someone who's, a, who's able to get a good feel for what's going to be motivational for that client, what are their hot buttons, what are their strengths, and how am I going to use all that information to guide them to the place where they can be solving this problem on their own. And then finally, coaches have to have the ability to sit with silence. This is a challenge for me. I have a great deal, when, when there's too much silence in the room, I have a bad habit of needing to fill it. But a good coach can sit there and give that client the opportunity to think through whatever process they need to think through. And there might be long stretches of silence in which you're just, they're just thinking. They're processing. This is a new thing for them, and they need the ability to work at it at their own pace. So that patience and that ability to sit with silence is critical if you're going to help them grow those skills that they need to be good problem solvers. A good rule of thumb is that if you're doing most of the talking, you are not coaching. The key is to bring them out by asking questions. When coaching, you're helping the client think for themselves. And how do you get someone to think? You ask a question. Making a statement leads to challenging. If you make a statement, if you say, well, and, and I, I'm going to draw a great deal on caregiver um, examples because that's, that's my primary uh, work area at this point in my life. So forgive me if I keep throwing out examples about caregivers, but that, that's my reality. And, and, and it's a good, it's a good, they're good examples, I think. So you might be, um, you might, you might be working with a caregiver, and they are, they're, they're obviously having problems with sleep deprivation. And it's really easy to sit there and say, well, you've just got to find more time to sleep. You, you need to have at least eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. That's what you need to do. And when you make those kind of statements, oftentimes people's first reaction is kind of digging their heels and say, well, yes, I know that, but I have this going on, I have that going on, you don't understand my situation, you don't understand the challenges I have. Wouldn't it be great if I could just simply do that, but I can't. Asking a question leads to them thinking about possible solutions rather than thinking about reasons why they can't do what you just suggested. So a question might be, have you thought about any ways in which you might be able to find some time, that, some quiet time in which you could catch up on a little sleep? Now that puts their thing, well, and, and they, they say, well, no, I can't do that. Well, have you considered, uh, is there anyone that you might be able to call? You know, you, 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 you help, by asking questions, you're still leading to solutions, but you're getting them to think through what the possible solution might be. It's important to use a problem-solving strategy. Not everybody knows that there, there are very basic steps that you can go through to solve problems. Now, this, this is a very quick and easy problem-solving strategy that I put together um, based on a lot of different strategies that I've read about. And you can, pull, you can, you can go online and find a number of different problem-solving strategies. But in my, in my language, this is, this is what I, I like to use. 
First, you nail down the problem. Then you creatively brainstorm solutions. You develop a very specific plan of action. Then you evaluate the results. Did it work? Did it fail? Does it need tweaking? We'll go into each of these in a little more detail now. Nail down the problem. The first thing you have to do is describe the problem in very concrete terms. For instance, we might walk in and be working with a caregiver, and we say, what is the number one challenge that you're dealing with right now? And, and she might say, well, my husband just goes nuts every evening around dinner time. Now, that has certain meaning to her. That sentence might create a different picture in your mind. So it's very important that you're both seeing the same picture so you both understand what the problem is and in very concrete terms. So you say, well, what does that mean? How, how, when he goes nuts, what does that look like? And she may say something like, well, I'll go in and start dinner, and in, within three minutes he's in the kitchen, he's walking around, he's picking up stuff, he's moving stuff around, he's asking me a thousand questions, he gets very agitated, um, he, he wants me to, to, to walk out of the kitchen with him, he, he just goes nuts and I can't, I can't deal with that. So now we have a picture of what it looks like, he's, the, the actions that he is taking that are problematic for her. Then the next step is, well, why is this a problem? You may have very good ideas of why that would be a problem for you. You might find that it's a whole different set of reasons why it's a problem for her. So you ask her, what about this behavior makes it a problem for you? Well, the thing about it is that I have to have dinner ready by a certain time because my son who lives with us works night shift and he has to have dinner by 7 o'clock in order to get to work on time. So when my husband comes in and makes all of these problems for me while I'm making dinner, then, then I can't get dinner ready for my son and he's late for work and that's a big problem. Plus, to tell you the truth, it just makes me angry. I really think that he doesn't have to do this. He knows I need to be making dinner. So I don't, I, I'm irritated that he's causing this problem for me. So now you know she's a couple of things. One is there's a time schedule involved that she needs to have something done by a certain time, and that's why that's the biggest part of the problem for her. She's trying to meet the needs of both her husband and her son, and there's a time schedule involved. The second piece is that she has in her mind that he's just kind of doing this to be a brat. So that's telling you that she probably doesn't really understand as much as she needs to understand about uh, what's going on with her husband's condition. She thinks he can still control or, or that he still understands that this would be a problem and he's just doing it to be um, a brat, like I said. So we, we can immediately see that the, there's some education that needs to take place. And we also we need to address that very concrete problem of getting dinner ready by a certain time or more importantly that her son gets to work on time in the evenings. So now you want to say, well, when did this start? Look for a cause for the problem. What do you think led to this? How did, how did this, how did this, when did this start becoming a problem for you? Well, there was a time when my husband and I used to take walks just before dinner every evening. And then we would come back and we would, together we would be able to fix dinner. But I've not been able to do that because I don't have time. I don't have as much time from looking after him throughout the day and making sure that that everything's in place. There's not as much time between uh, the t before dinner for me to, to for us to do that. Plus, to tell you the truth, I don't feel that safe being out and about the neighborhood. He might try to to go into somebody's yard or something like that. So I don't feel safe taking him for the walks. Plus, he certainly can't help me with dinner anymore. So what that tells us is that, that he's missing probably, he's probably missing the time, that special time they had together, that quality time they had together, the exercise of walking, and the, the, the worthiness he felt of being able to help with dinner. So he's experiencing quite a bit of loss in this activity that used to be done together every evening. So that is something that could be addressed that might help subside the problem for a little bit. Then you want to find out from the caregiver what would have to happen, what would need to change to solve this problem. She might say, well, I need him to stay the devil out of the kitchen so I can get dinner ready every evening. And that would be the ultimate solution. 
Okay, well, let's say that that's not possible. What would need to change to make the problem acceptable or tolerable? What would have to change so that you would be okay and it wouldn't be such a big deal for you? And that might be, well, if he would, um, if, if I would be able to get dinner on the table by 7 for my, for my son, then that would be okay. I wouldn't mind him being in the kitchen as long as he didn't interrupt my ability to provide dinner on a timely basis. So now you've got a range of, um, of what the solution might look like. Best, t best case scenario, he stay out of the kitchen. But tolerable scenario is that he can be in the kitchen but not keep her from doing what he needs to do. So it's really important to have those two points of reference for any problem that you're going to solve. And then you brainstorm possible solutions. First thing to do is ask her, well, I, this, problem, this has been a problem for a while. Um, what have you tried so far? And she may say something like, well, I had tried locking the kitchen door to keep him out, and I've tried, um, I've tried asking him not to come in the kitchen. I've tried begging him not to come in. I've tried yelling at him about coming in the kitchen. And uh, none of that worked. Well, why do you think that didn't work? So, well, it was really, it, it caused more problems than it helped because he, then he became very agitated. When I locked the door, he became very agitated and almost beat the door down. We almost had to have it repaired. And then he just doesn't, he, he'll try to pay attention to me when I ask him, but in five minutes he's back in. Apparently he just can't remember what I've asked him to do. So then you start brainstorming about what you should try next. And you just at, you're, you're, you're leading her through that um, with some questions. She say, well, what, sh what should you try next? Well, I have, have no idea what to try next. That's what you're here for. Well, let's think about the pieces of it. Do you suppose that, that it could be th that your husband is missing the time that y'all have had together? Well, yeah, that could be it. Can you think of any things that you and your husband could do together before uh, dinner that might replace that walk that would be just as satisfying to him? Have you thought about how you might keep him occupied? Are there any ways in which you could keep him occupied while you're, while you're preparing dinner? You know, help her think through those kind of solutions. Have you ever considered on the nights that it's just really difficult to know that if you haven't started dinner by a certain time, maybe your son should know it's time to go out and, um, and, and get dinner somewhere else? What, what other options does your son have to have dinner? So you're, you're asking her questions, you're getting her to think about the solutions, and you're also encouraging creative exploration. Just throw anything out on the table. It, nothing, nothing, is, nothing is tossed aside during this process um, as, as not feasible, not at this point. During the next point is when you analyze to see what is feasible. And once you come up with a few possible solutions, then you go through them and you ask the questions, is this something that you can do? Is this feasible? Is this something that's physically possible, reasonable for you to do? And then think through it step by step. What do you think will be the effect of this a action? Do you, think that it, do you think it's going to, um, will it cause more agitation? Will, will your son be agreeable to, to do it? Will there be some sort of repercussions financially if he has to eat out? You know, just think through all of those possible effects of the action. And then if you come to, when you come to the solutions that you think are more, most feasible, most suitable, you think through the steps, step by step, and the possible outcomes of each of those steps. As you're planning, as you're setting up your plan of action, the first thing to do is to break it down into doable steps. What should you do first? If, if we've decided, if you've decided that the best thing to do is to um, spend some time, spend 30 minutes with him together before you go in the kitchen, and then have some activities for him while, that he can do while you're preparing dinner, what should you do first? What's the most urgent action to take in this plan? And who else needs to be involved? 
When you're developing these plans of action, you need to be very spe specific. Paint the picture. So there's no like, oh, well, I hadn't thought about that. They need to know exactly what steps to take. And remember, we're taking baby steps, and we're building our baby wings. So explain, when are we going to do this? Where are we going to do it? How? How much? How often? Um, ask all of those questions as you develop that plan so that, she's, so that she won't be stuck in the middle of it when you're not there going, now, now what do I do? That, that planning piece is critical. And then you go to practice. <clears throat> By practice, I mean role play. You can pretend to be the husband, or she can pretend to be the husband, and you take the role of, of her role. It really depends on the caregiver. Sometimes they might want to see you demonstrate um, how you would respond, because she'd be able to demonstrate the behaviors that she's seen in him, so that would be a very realistic way to go. Or if you feel like she's capable of, or up to the task of, of right out of the chute practicing uh, the, the steps of the plan that you've, you've created, then let them be the, the, the play the, their own role and you be the care recipient. But this is a, this is a big piece because people can intellectually understand what they're going to do. They can really feel like they have a great idea. The plan is in place. I know what I'm going to do. But until you actually act it out, it's not, it's not real. And it can be very intimidating to try to put a plan into action that you haven't already had some experience and practice with. Just like running up and down those courts of basketball practice, the practice is necessary for these kinds of behaviors. We're asking them to practice new behaviors, and that is critical to give them that opportunity. And then finally, you're going you're gonna to set a schedule for a follow-up on that plan. Next week, I'll be calling you, and we're going to talk about how this worked. Or I'm here every month at our next visit next month. We'll go over to see how well this is working for you. You'll know better what kind of time frame is necessary to try the plan out and give it a chance to work. And when you conduct that follow-up session, you're going to be asking, how, how did it go? Did it work? Is there something you would do differently next time? Are there any little tweaks you need to do? Or are they like, oh, gee, I wish that I had done it differently? And are there any changes that you want to make? Now, this is the time you want to draw this out of them. You don't need to be telling them what you think happened or your opinion on, on how it went. You want to help them think through it instead. This is also a good time to remind them of what, what they thought was a problem solved and what they thought was a, a problem that they could live with and tolerate. Now, there are going to be times when the caregiver or the client are going to come up with some solutions that you don't think are such good solutions, and you would have come up with something else. And, and you're biting your tongue to keep from telling them what your solution would be. But I want to encourage you to go through that evaluation process where you're asking them, um, is this doable? What do you think the effects are going to be? How do you think you're going to be able? What are the steps? When you go through that evaluation process, if their solution stands up, then it's best to go with their solution. Because you don't want to be this guy that's screaming at your player, telling them everything, every move to make. Remember, that's not the coach we want to be. We want to be this coach. We want to be the coach that has given them the tools that they needed to be successful, and they'll carry us out on their shoulders when they feel empowered. I can't tell you how gratifying it is to see the light in somebody's face when they came up with a solution, enacted it, and it worked. It can be such a boost to them on so many different levels that you will be so proud of them and of yourself for making that happen. Earlier I said that in case management you get to be the hero and in coaching the, the client gets to be the hero. Well, really, when you do it well, when you empower them to be their own problem solvers, you both get to be the heroes. And that's a really good feeling. There are going to be those clients who really want you to stay in the driver's seat. 
They're going to be reluctant to take on this role. There are going to be times when you say, you know, I'm just going to have to step in and tell these people what to do. I want you to really resist that because coaching will work. It will take all that patience I, I spoke about earlier, that willingness to sit in silence and let them take whatever time they need to to think through this process. But even when you think it won't work, if you stay the course, they will be able to learn those problem solving. It's not rocket science. It's just people, people who are used to having their problems solved by someone else needs to exercise those problem-solving muscles until they get strong enough, and then they will learn how to do it for themselves. And they will be so much better equipped down the road to deal with those problems when there's no one else there to help them. And you will have eternally changed their lives for the better. Now, at this point in time during the classroom session, that I, which I originally gave this presentation, we had a practice session in which I had the attendees break into groups of three. One person played the role of a caregiver, one person played the role of a coach, and then one person kept score. Then they marked every time the coach either told them what to do or asked the question. And then the scorekeeper at the end, that you got a score by subtracting the number of statements made from the number of questions asked. And the higher the number of questions, the better your score. I'm not sure if the people who are watching this online would have an opportunity to do this, but I do, just like, I've, just like we want our caregivers or our clients to practice those problem-solving steps that we, that plan that we put into place, I really urge you to do that as well. To go through a session, a mock session with someone, or a mock assessment, or, or whatever, whatever way in which you deliver services to your clients, and practice leading them through the problem-solving process by asking questions rather than making statements. And afterwards, ask yourself, how did that go? Did I end up asking more questions than making suggestions? And, and always remember, if you find that you're talking more than the client, then ooh, take a breath. Remember, you're helping them find their own answers, but you're leading them to those answers with the right questions. To receive a certificate for this training, you must score 70% or higher on the quiz. There is a quiz that will have a link to it at the end of this presentation. Um, if there's more than one person at the computer looking at this, you will want to each go to a computer, pull up the link. Once you've completed the quiz, it will be graded by our staff at RCI. And those who have received a score of 70% or higher will receive a certificate via email. If you have any questions or want to discuss this any further, again, I am Gail Alston, the Director of Community Initiatives. You can reach me at gail.alston at gsw.edu. I appreciate your attention. I appreciate your, um, your pursuing this knowledge on coaching. And I know that you're going to make a big difference in the lives of those you serve by empowering them to problem solve on their own and improve their lives in many ways. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.